What's up, Savage Steve? Welcome to Dad Edge, my friend. What's up, Freak? How's it going? Freak, yeah. I should have remembered the Freak, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's good to see you again, man. Good to see you. Thanks for having me on. It's going to be awesome. Looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So first of all, let's have the audience just get to know uh, who you are just a little bit. So I always like to start out with just some quick warm-up questions before we just dive right into some content. So one of the questions I love to ask is, what do you like to do outside of work and outside of family that brings you a ton of joy? Kill, kill. (laughs) No, just kidding. Just kidding, sort of. But kill, kill, kill your goals, kill your kill the day, just get whatever it is, like whatever's going on in that moment, just to get after it. That's literally a a term I tell myself thousands of times a day is kill, like just go for it. So things that we do, I do outside of work and outside of family, there's really not much there because even hobbies I have or things that I do on the side for fun, if you want to call it, almost always involves them for the most part. That could be hiking, biking, training, working out. I mean, we work out all the time, every day, literally seven days a week of training, especially this year, we set a goal this year to take zero days off for the entire year of 2022, me and my, me and my son. And we're so far, we just finished a month and we're hundred percent success rate. So it's training, it's shooting. We like, we like guns. We also then to then get the fix of that is to go, to go do some video games. We will say that's like our, I call it stupid time. We have a stupid time on the calendar where it's time to check out, to, to just veg out because you need that. You need to detach from the, the craziness of the real world. So we'll do that with video games or we'll go build some Legos or do some stuff like that. But is really not much outside of the, the family and the business. And my, my business is run with the family. We do all the exercise and training and stuff together. But that, that's pretty much what the kind of things that we're doing on a regular basis, literally every day, all day. Awesome, man. Uh, I have no doubt. So we're going to dive into some of those challenges and some of those things you do with your son and actually your whole family later on. Uh, Another question I have for you, what was your sport of choice growing up and why? Believe it, I I don't even like sports now. I don't watch sports too much because I kind of got out of the, the, as I got older and, and started having a family, started having my own stresses and building a business and all this other stuff. And you, you see guys on Sunday morning, or Monday morning at work after their team just lost a football game and they're all fucking depressed and and down and out and they're talking about it and they're analyzing and they know all the statistics about how many passes and how many interceptions and all this other stuff. And they're all depressed and they feel so bad for that quarterback who's making 30, 40, 50 million dollars a year. Do you think that motherfucker is sitting home on a Tuesday afternoon when you blew the sale and you didn't close the deal? You think they're sitting there and worried about you? Hell no. Cause they're focusing on themselves and their craft and their perfection. So that's the only part of sports that I still like is their discipline that they have and the mastery they have, but I really don't follow sports much more anymore. But as a kid, it was baseball. And that was actually the sport that kind of was a turning point in my life when it comes to probably what we're going to get into about being a role model and, and, and breaking the cycles with, with my father, because I don't know if you follow baseball at all, but in New York, 1986, the Mets are in the world series and there's a big game against the Boston Red Sox, game six. I don't know if you know much about it, what happens in game six. But the Mets are about to be eliminated. And me and my, my brother, who's 10 years older than me, and my father are sitting there. We, re- we never did anything together, never talked about anything, never had any father-son conversations ever. The only thing we would ever do is sit there sometimes and watch parts of a baseball game if, if he wasn't drunk or whatever, or even when he was drunk. But we'd be sitting there watching that. We're game six. The Mets are losing. Ground ball, first base, Bill Buckner, he's, he goes down to get it. It goes through his legs. Me and my brother are going, jumping up and down, going fucking crazy because now the Mets are now going to go on to game seven of the World Series where they eventually go on to win. My father starts screaming, cursing, throwing shit, and leaves the house, and we don't see him the rest of the di- night, or I don't even remember the, when, when we saw him after that. And, and I didn't know till years later the reason why that he – bet all his money, all his paycheck on the Mets actually fucking losing. We were diehard Mets fans. And to know that all he cared about was the gambling, the money. And he was so upset that they actually won. I couldn't understand it. Couldn't comprehend it. And as I look back now, that was like the turning point about, all right, now we're going to break the cycle and change the way things go. But baseball, I'd say in a long story was, was the sport because then I also would play nine inning games of baseball against the side of my house because I really didn't have too many friends in the area, in the neighborhood or ever. I don't know why they they thought it was a fucking weirdo. Maybe I don't know, but I would literally play a nine inning game of baseball against 
the wall. I, I always joked that my best friend as a kid was the side of the house was a fucking wall. I would throw a tennis ball against it and literally play a nine inning game and call balls and strikes. And there's a fence. And if it went over, it was a home run. And I'd go through the entire fucking game and just play baseball. So long, that was a long version of saying probably baseball back then. Now, if I had to say it's, it's boxing MMA or whatever, but that's starting to get commercialized too. But yeah, that's, that's pretty much where it's at as far as sports are concerned. So I obviously didn't know you were going to say that about Bill Buckner. Do you know the story about what Bill Buckner said the week before that happened? No, I don't. Okay. So I just heard this not too long ago. So uh, this really, this really obviously proves the point of what you put out there, what you start to, what you focus on will expand, right? Mm -hmm. Good and bad. He was in an interview. It was a week or two before that game, or it might've been right when they made those, the playoffs right then. And he was asked, what is your greatest fear about the series? And he said, the greatest fear that I have is a ball will be hit to me and it'll be, it'll go between my legs and I'll lose the game because of it. Wow. And then what happened? Exactly yep. what he put out in the world, which was fascinating. Um, you know, and before we jump into your history, obviously, cause you alluded to a few of the things we're going to be talking about, but last question I have for you is what is something that you're curious to learn? in your life at some point that you don't have the skill set yet? Probably something to do with human nature. I study personal development now and leadership. I've been like, a, I'm addicted to, to freaking reading and studying and learning and humans are just so fascinating and fucked up at the same time that probably something on the psychology side of human nature is much, the more you read about it, the more you learn about it, the, the less you know about it, about how people are and how people react and why people do things the way they do. And, and I'd say it's somewhere along the lines of that. Cool. I love it, man. Let's, let's, uh, let's dive into what it was like for you as a kid. Now you mentioned you had a brother, right? Yeah. Brother, brother and four sisters, brother and four sisters. That's a lot of kids, man. And where are you in the mix? The youngest, the youngest. Okay. So talk to me a little bit about, uh, what was the relationship with, your own mom and dad, in particular, your dad growing up. Yeah. So as I kind of was saying before, as far as I can remember, and I, I didn't move out of the house till I was 19 years old. So I went to the Marine Corps. Although those last few years, I really didn't, wasn't at home much kind of out in the street and doing all kinds of stuff, whatever. But so 19 years of living in the same house, I can't remember one single conversation that I had with my father, not a single conversation about anything, about anything not even really the sports once in a while, we would maybe just see part of a game together, but that was it. Never learned anything about sports or never had a catch or threw a football or, or sat and played Legos on the floor or taught me about girls or life or work, careers, jobs, interviewing for a job, driving a car, changing a fucking tire, nothing. Literally. I can't remember a single thing. So to me, that was, I would, I would, I would feel as I was a ghost growing up as I'm just a ghost. I'm just there. And I would try and just blend in with the crowd, hide in the corners. Like so much that when I was like three from three to, I don't know how many years, like if we went out of the house, I would wear this fucking Zorro mask. Cause I thought it would hide me that the world wouldn't see who I was. I don't know how my mother let me do it. Cause I looked like a fucking weirdo, but I also can't, I guess that's why the kids didn't want to play me on the playground. Cause they thought it was strange too, but literally I would wear this, Zorro mask everywhere I went outside of the house. I don't know what, I don't even know what the thought process was behind it, but I, it was something about trying to hide and not see, show who I am or being afraid of who I was or just being a ghost and trying to just hide maybe my identity. Don't know exactly what it is, but that's pretty much what it was like growing up, feeling you know, I'm the youngest kid in this poor family and not having a, a positive male role model. And it just made, it's just, you're just a ghost and, and you could, split off as you grow up as an adult, you can go in, in a couple of different directions off of a child like that. And it's, it's really your decision, which direction you're going to go. So yeah, the, the youngest of six kids and growing up, was it just the fact that, was it a mixture of a couple of different things? Like, so for instance, was your, did your dad just maybe not identify as like, Hey, this is really not my role. I'm just a provider. Or was it maybe that the house was just so busy with six kids or what do you think it was looking back? People, people use the, the saying nowadays to justify how people acted. And they say, well, they did the best with what they knew with what they had. I hear that a lot lately about people justifying, I guess that's what they're maybe they're, 
therapist told them or their psychiatrist told them of how to deal with their fucking trauma or whatever. But I think people are just selfish, have issues, never work on themselves. It wasn't like going to be a provider. Like we, we didn't have, we wouldn't get shit for Christmas or birthdays. It'd be like very minimal, poor little cheap, little, little toys or whatever. And it, it was probably a family history. I think it's like that. If that's what you're taught, you can decide, all right, I'm either going to learn from that and be like that or learn from that and be the fucking opposite of that. And most people, the easy way, the easy route is all right. That's what I'm told. That's what I'm shown. I'm just going to just keep following that trend and keep that cycle going of negative male role models, because I know that's what his father was. His father actually lived with us at some portion after his, my grandmother died. My father's father lived with us for a while. And he was a drunk, a gambler getting arrested at like 80 something years old, like getting in fights and getting kicked out of nursing homes. Like, so it's a, I think it's a trend. Like people, they, they, there's something in, in our DNA that we just follow those trends, but then there's some other piece of the DNA at one point that there has to be this stubbornness DNA that says, all right, I'm going to be the one to break the fucking cycle. Like eventually someone's got to do that or else your family tree will just rot into obscurity. Was there a moment for you? So obviously you were raised in this environment where it was pretty chaotic as far as like a lot of moving parts, a lot of things you, you uh, obviously saw and, um, things your dad did, things that he didn't do. Was there a point in your life when you were like, yeah, this ends with me? Always in the back of my head. I really thought that as a kid, I remember as a kid, sometimes I, I would, my father pissed me off. I didn't have a heavy bag, but I really was, I liked boxing also started to get into it. I would take an old mattress. I had literally an old, like pissy fucking mattress. And I would wrap it up around a bedpost and tie it with ropes. And that would be my heavy bag. And there's wires sticking out of it. And I would just punch it. Didn't have any boxing gloves. I would just use my hands. I would play uh, some, I forget the hip. But one time I remember when I was older, it was uh, LL Cool J. Mama said, knock you out. I play that, like basically giving a warning to my father while I'm hitting the thing up there. But uh, it was, it was crazy and chaotic. And I always kind of knew that, all right, this isn't the way I want to go, but I would fall down that trap. I got in a lot of trouble as a, as a teenager then eventually literally went from a courthouse to the, to the Marine Corps. They said, all right, it's the Marines or jail, take your pick. And it was just the Marines. It would only allow, cause that was a minimum of a four year, four year contract. All the other armed services was two years. So even then though, it, I still knew that, all right, I need to break that. It was always in my head. I remember as a kid thinking, all right, I'm, I'm going to be nothing like that man when I'm older. I'm going to dedicate my life to being the exact opposite, seeing everything he does and pick it apart, the, every bit of his, his nature and do the exact opposite. And that's going to make me, a fucking success in this world, but still those traits are like, they're dug into you and they've been beaten into you, into your DNA that probably not until I actually had my son. And we're talking only 10 years ago that it really actually clicked in. It was always there somewhere in there. I could knew there was something like, what's the missing piece? Always would kind of say what's missing. Like, where is the missing piece? And that was probably it. Once my, my son was born. And then I realized uh, I had a business. And I was working all the time, working running the entire, our entire gym by myself because my wife then was at home with the baby and pregnant and stuff. So I realized that even though I'm, I'm hustling, I'm working, I, I tell myself I'm doing this for my son is even after he was born, like a couple months old. And I said, you know what? I got to start building this business a different way or else I'll still end up being like my father. My son still won't see his father enough if I'm just fucking working all the time. So it kind of had that aha moment, like shortly after my son was born that, all right, it's time to build an entire different type of role model and business model so that I'm not following that same path in one way or the other. So I can, I can really relate to your childhood and your upbringing. I mean, cause mine was, you know, without getting into the whole details and being time sensitive, it was pretty darn crazy. And, um, I too had that epiphany of like, Hey, this is not going to happen on my watch. And I particularly remember when I held my first son, the one who's at the Squire program with me, he's my oldest of four. Mm -hmm. and having that realization that it's, it's gotta, it's gotta stop here. It's gotta, but the, the, the point was too that the, the crossroads that I was at, and I'm so curious to hear what emerged for you was where do I start? Not exactly sure where to start or exactly even what to do. I remember feeling that feeling at time 15 years ago mm -hmm. for you, for you, where did you start? Started with, 
probably with books, reading, started like, all right, I, I didn't, wasn't a reader. I just thought it was a waste of time reading. Also finding other men, other, whether they're peers or mentors, role models, people who are, have done what I'm looking to do, both in business and in life, both in making money and in making, creating a family, things like that. And spending time around, trying to be around more people like that. Was, would be a huge thing. And spending time with people in books because you, you shit a book, you can get 20, 30 years of knowledge in a 300 page book of someone who's smarter than all of us combined. Like there's some, some power into that and so much you can learn and so much knowledge and wisdom to soak in from that. So that's when I started really getting addicted to reading and learning, really realizing, shit, I'm a father now and I don't know shit. I'm sure I have a business making some money, but I really don't know shit about the world, about life. I don't even know shit about myself. So it started with really working on myself by reaching out to to role, different role models and peers and coaches and getting out there, going to events, getting out of the bubble that I was in, thinking that I could do everything myself, thinking that it's I'm, I'm supposed to be the man. I'm supposed to do everything alone and I don't need help from anyone. I can do it all. And including in business, I, I did that for so long, thinking that I didn't even need to run any promotions or sales or marketing that we have the best product out there. That's all we should need to do, right? Like, uh, Kevin Costner, if you build it, they will come. Oh, guess what, motherfucker? You build it. They don't just automatically come. You got to go deep and put in the work and learn and get get some coaching and guidance and mentoring and, and, and other leaders. Because how am I going to develop a future leader in my son if I'm not even a fucking leader myself? Yeah, you know, I, so a couple of different things there, right? You started off with reading right? Being exposed to content, new ideas, you know, books written by people who are smarter than all of us in the room put together, probably. Mm -hmm. Also, you really hit upon uh, surrounding ourselves with the right people, the right community, which is really hard for men because we have this idea or this perception that we should be lone wolfing it. We need to be doing it all by ourselves. And if we have to ask for help, we're super weak. And um, I want to start with the books first, though. What were, what's, a, what's one, two or three books that looking back on it, and I can just tell by looking at the background, you've, you've definitely have spent some serious time reading some books, but what are, what were one, two or three books that you were just like, man, like this one, this one changed the game for me a little bit. This one was the biggest aha moment in some of these areas. So many of them. And I, and it's crazy with all these books, I could literally point to a certain book. I know exactly where they all are. Cause I've been to them so much. I'd say probably uh, Psycho Cybernetics is one of my my top favorite books. I've read that and listened to it so many different times. Uh, Outwitting the Devil, a lot of Napoleon Hill stuff. But I, I, not just the, everyone does the Think and Grow Rich, but there's some other Napoleon Hill stuff like Outwitting the Devil. That's just a whole different perspective, a whole different way of looking at things and, and looking at life and the world. And another one of his is How to Own Your Own Mind. That was fucking huge for me, I remember. But Psycho Cybernetics, I always... For some reason that sticks out when someone asks that question, that's one that pops up. And I've always wondered, why does that, why is that the one that always pops up? And I realized there was something in that book that did it. It, it flipped a few switches in me, like about realizing that I can't do everything by myself. Cause it, you, you, like you said, the lone wolf, you think it's all up to us. We're a, we're a pussy. If we can't do it ourselves, if we need help, we have to ask for help. We think we're badasses that we don't need help. And, and we're really, if you're the one that is afraid to ask for help and, things you could do by your own. That may, that's the exact opposite of a badass. The badass is one that knows when they need help, knows when they can be vulnerable, knows when they can not be great at everything and realize they're not, they need some assistance in areas. So something about that book helped me have a lot of breakthroughs. And, and I've gone through it so many times that I've never even pinpointed exactly what the point is. But even things like, I'm awkward socially. I don't do well around people like at a, with small talk and stuff like that. And had all kinds of other, little quirks or whatever things about me that when I read that book, I literally just stopped them immediately. Like weird little OCD things that I had for maybe 10, 20, who knows years that I just stopped in the middle of reading that book. And, and it just something in there clicked. And that's when I realized reading is how powerful reading and what you can learn and the wisdom and knowledge and actual effect you could have in your, your, your life. If you take it serious. Yeah, man, leaders are, are uh, readers are leaders. You know, that's for sure. Always learning, always evolving. And listen, that's really reassuring to hear that, especially from someone like you. And I've gotten to get to know you just a little bit than probably the rest of the audience. Um, Cause we obviously spent some time together in California. When I went through the Squire program, we talked for a few minutes while I was there. Um, 
the whole deal around community. Now, every we we've I've talked about this on the podcast many many times. Have different guests talk about. It. You mentioned the lone wolf. Hey, I'm 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 this or I'm that. If I have to reach out for help, you know, a lot of guys who listen to this show, you know, they they are of the mentality of like, man, I I really need to know how to do this right automatically, whatever quote unquote this is. But when was the biggest realization where you found power? in surrounding yourself with people that were going to help you elevate. And then also you were going to help them elevate this, just an iron sharpens iron type of community. On a, a small scale without realizing it was in jail. And then a, a bigger scale after that would be in the Marine Corps. But even then both of those situations, you're kind of young and you really don't realize it. And you look back on it now and you, you have things like the, the military, you appreciate it so much more 10, 20 years later, you realize what you really had and what you learn and the lessons you learn without even realizing it, the life lessons in leadership and community and brotherhood that you had. So that's really where, when I look back, that's where it started clicking, but it didn't really click in again until again, after my son was born, I started then working on myself, learning more about myself, getting out into different groups and going to events like different personal development events or seminars, whatever it is, mastermind groups like that, again, getting coaches and then actually then start coaching other people. So probably when I had the transition from getting coached to then starting coaching other people, like in the project that we have, that, that type of community that we create in the project and in the Squire program, to me, that, that's, that's like the biggest aha moment about that stuff is like seeing the power of relationships and a community that you can have. Like uh, one of the project graduates just sent me a message yesterday, just an email just yesterday telling me, and he's 57 years old from upstate New York. And he told me that he can't imagine how people can complain about the, the price of the project. It's $12,000 program. He said, cause he's now graduated over a year ago and it affects him every single day. And knowing that now he has a hundred and I think there's like 114 graduates that he can just call at a moment's notice. And any one of them, no questions asked would either take him into their home or show up to upstate New York with a, a shovel and, and, and some rope and chains to come help him out of it. Whatever situation it is like is fucking priceless. So as I see the development as, as an adult, the Marine Corps is easy. You're 19. You're told to go do this with these people. This is the mission. It's very easy. It's just so easy to do. Once you're out in the real world and you have career and kids and businesses and responsibilities and stress and all kinds of things going on in different areas, that's just as scary or even more scary than the, the thought of battle or war. So realizing the community that men specifically need, women naturally flock to each other, right? They just, that's like in their fucking DNA. Men, it doesn't work so much. The men really are lacking in having that, being surrounded by other like-minded, hungry, motivated, kick-ass men of fire who they can relate to and they can rely on for account, support, ability, support accountability, and and really camaraderie. It's, it's, it's lacking. And as I see that, as I develop and growing businesses, getting in these communities and actually being a coach and bringing people together, like being on the other end of it, it's fucking powerful. You know, tell me, actually, I, I'm really curious. Tell me about a time where you were a part of a community and you elevated to a level in your life. It could be in your health. It could be your mental state. It could be your business, your profession or whatever else. And looking back on it, you know, for a fact, you couldn't have gotten to that level without the community of men that you had around you? Every stage, again, there was all those different stages, but a, a, a breakthrough was when I actually realized I couldn't do stuff on my own. So I had a business, was struggling because I was doing everything and realized I had to hire a coach. And I joined a, a mastermind group actually with Bedros. He was my original business coach, mentor. And I joined one of his mastermind groups and realized, holy shit, there's other fucked up people out there just like me that are struggling that have similar problems and situations. And that was really just on the business side, but you end up connecting. And there's people I was in mastermind groups with six, seven years ago that I'm still in, in contact with and have, have great relationships with to this day. So that kind of showed me the, the, the relationships that can build out of that, the community that can build out of that. And then again, the project now is a whole nother level of that, that community. Awesome. Uh, how about for, so what about for fatherhood or for, for maybe even marriage, like some of the, some of the seasons we go through as, as married men 
And some of the seasons we go through as fathers, you know, we go through these growing pains, not every day is the same, but uh, when has a community helped you uh, elevate in those areas? Really, when it comes to that specifically is I look back to my greatest mentor when it comes to fatherhood, to raising a family, exactly how to do everything in life the right way. And I look at my best mentor, my best role model. And that's why I say, thank God I had a fucked up childhood. Not like, oh, fuck me. I had a fucked up childhood. It's like, fuck yeah, I had a fucked up childhood. So I look back at my greatest mentor when it comes to that. And it's what I already talked about is my father. Looked at him. He doesn't even know it. He taught me. Like if, if I didn't have that, I probably would just be an average, lazy fat dad that doesn't do shit with their kids, just goes and works and comes home and thinks we're supposed to go talk to their kids for 15, 30 minutes a day about school and then go watch TV on, on the fucking couch, eating, drinking a beer and all this other stuff. If I didn't have that to show me, to teach me, that was my greatest teacher. And that was my greatest breakthroughs. And that's still to this day, look back and study it and think about it, about how can I make this even better? So Thank God I had a shitty childhood. That's that's and that's a perspective of having anything. Turn any suffering into a superpower is is a powerful thing. When you can kind of get your mind around that, it makes everything a, a, a bonus. Everything has an upside, has a positive side. And really, that that was my biggest help in becoming what I consider. I consider I try to be a, a super dad every freaking day. And I thank my father for it. He doesn't realize how much he helped me by being a shitty dad. And then from there. On, a, on an actual community note would be just the other instructors of the project getting together and knowing that I have to show up as a leader, as a savage servant, as it says in here. You know, I talk about it all the time. I tell people don't, and I, and I coach people on it. Don't give a fuck what anyone thinks about you. I tell them that all the time, be your freak self, plant your fucking freak flag in the ground, let it wave high and don't give a shit what anyone thinks about you. But there is a, a caveat to that. You don't want to ever be on the extreme opposite end of anything. You want to cut those, those peaks and valleys. So it's a skill and a, a discipline to know who to give a fuck what they think about you. There are certain people, like as I've gotten to know you, of course, I care what you would think about me. You're not, you wouldn't fall into that category of don't give a fuck what they think about you. So knowing the difference between those two. So when I show up with, with the project, other instructors, they're all just high caliber men and just kicking ass in all areas of life. It's like I'm. It, it forces me to level up. It's almost a competition who can continue keeping the bar and setting the bar higher. And it pushes you and pressures you in a, in a good way because you absolutely do give a fuck what the people in your tribe think about you. You need to, you should, but then that's a very small select groups of people that you do care about and the rest. Sure. Then don't worry about that. I like what you said there. And I want, I want you to talk a little bit about your, your freak self, because you basically talked about that when we were on top of that hill in, uh, in California, when we were going through the Squire program. So I want to give you time to talk about that as well. Cause I thought it was brilliant. There's one thing that I want men to really, really catch here. And that is, it, it's interesting just getting to know you, Steve, because so, you know, my, my boys, especially my two older ones, one you met, one you haven't, they'll ask me, they'll be like, Hey, you know, tell, tell me a story when you were a kid and they'll want to hear something like crazy. Right. And I'll tell them something crazy and they'll be like, Oh, I feel so bad for you. And I'm like, don't, I don't, yeah. don't feel bad for me. I don't feel bad for me. I was like, if anything, I have nothing but gratitude about how I grew up. And they're like, how? And I'm like, because it's led me to the person I am now, which is I've got a great relationship with you. I've got a great relationship with mom. And I don't know if any of that would have happened if it, if I didn't come from this background of a lot of challenge, a lot of chaos and a lot of craziness. Like now I'm crazy motivated to make sure that that doesn't happen on my watch. And I don't know if I would have had like this beautiful childhood with white picket fences and all this other crap. Like I might've been a terrible father. I was like, but probably you know, average, mediocre. Hell yeah. I hear you. And, yeah. and we get guys, like, there's always a percentage of guys that come through the project exactly like that. They come there, they hear the other stories of all the like kids that were molested and beaten, like brutally beaten and whatever, just left on the street, like crazy, horrific stories we hear. And then we'll get that certain percentage. And it's a, it's a whatever, 20, 25% that say, I feel bad for all those stories. I can't believe you all had to go through that. I, 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 feel like I shouldn't be here because my problem is I had a great childhood. I had a regular, you know, a good childhood. My parents that took care of me, but 
They never really taught me things. They never really taught me how to think. They never really taught me how to figure stuff out on my own. They never really gave me the tools. So now I'm an adult and I'm still in this little child's mind frame of, all right, the world should be doing things for me. I don't really know how to do anything. I'm just like fucking clueless as a grown man. We're talking 30, 40 year old men that basically giving your kids too easy of a life and too good of a life is a fucking disservice to them. So thank, so I say, thank God that happened to me. And, and even, even there's men out there that have, were, had those, whatever, were molested as a child. And it's like, at a certain point, once they get older and they've worked through that trauma, obviously it's like, thank God that happened to me because it made me who I am now. And if not, those parents who don't put, that's why I put my, my kids and I, we do go through some crazy tough shit together because it, I call it manufactured adversity. They're not going to have a shitty child like I did. I'm, I give them a great fucking life, but they're going to need to learn the ways of the world. And we're going to do that other ways. We're going to find creative, fun ways of making that happen. Yeah. And I, I want to talk about that here in a second. I'm, I can't wait to get to that, especially all the stories that you've done with, especially your son, Tyson. Real quick though, I want to make sure men really understand this. So Steve, you'll get a kick out of this. Uh, I actually got an email from uh, a listener of the podcast. This was a while ago, but I will never forget it. And he's like, Hey man, like um, I have anger issues with my kids and I, I, I lose my patience with my kids all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm quick to temper. So I wrote this guy back and I was like, why is that? And literally this was this guy's story. I come from a lineage of men with anger issues. It's actually in my genetic DNA that I am an angry person because that's where every man has been in my life. And I was like, and I, I think I actually wrote him back and I said, do you actually believe this? Like literally I just called him out and like, do you actually buy into that? Because I honestly, I, I honestly wholeheartedly 100% um, identify with you are the epitome of your story. So like, for instance, you and I could have easily turned out a, a crazy, terrible life if we had decided, well, that's the way I was brought up. So it's just going to be this way for me too. Yeah. Right. Or you can be like, you know what? I was brought up this way. And that's the whole reason this is not going to continue. And if I use that guy as an example, you could be like, I come from a long line of angry people and that stops right here. Right. So it's, it's whatever we experience, Right do we buy into the fact that we can actually make the difference and do something different? Or are we just going to basically lay down and be like, well, this is just the way it is. Right. Yeah. Which is a, unfortunate. Like a story fable, whatever you want to call it about two twin brothers. And one of them's yeah. a crackhead homeless. The other one's a, a multimillionaire. They go to the crackhead. They're like, how'd you end up a crackhead and homeless and whatever. And he's like, well, my, father was neg neglected me. He was an alcoholic. He beat me all the time. He, he didn't pay attention to me. And that's why I'm this homeless crackhead. They went to his multimillionaire brother. They said, how'd you end up becoming a multimillionaire? He said, well, my dad neglected me. He beat me. He never paid any attention to me. And that's why I became, um, that's how I became a multimillionaire. It's all about how you use it. You take the tools in and you use it. It's your, it's your fucking decision. And I know there's addictions out there and there's chemical imbalances. Of course, there's mental illness. I'm, I, I agree with that. But I, I think 90, 99% of the time when people are on medications or mental illness or depression or all this other stuff, I understand it's out there. I don't want to you know, get some people saying, well, you don't understand depression or less. I know it's out there. But 99% of the people that are on medication, that shit don't need it. They just need to make better fucking decisions is what they need to do. It, it's it's. All it is, that's just the easy way out most of the time is to put labels on yourself and on this and that. And that's how it's supposed to be. It's just bullshit. It's a fucking excuse. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big proponent of that as well, as far as like, you know, hey, we can we can buy into whatever story we're going to tell ourselves or we can uh, we can rewrite it. And I love that. I love that uh, that story of of the two twins. Uh, I heard that a long time ago, actually, from Mark Devine, who came on the podcast like years ago. Uh, he used that same analogy. Uh, I want to get to some of these manufactured adversities that you do with your son. And number one, from a psychological standpoint, I think it's brilliant. Um, we also do, we don't do them every month, but I would definitely say we do them at least four times a year. We will do something big, right? Something kind of mm -hmm. gnarly, something that scares us, right? Something yeah. that we wouldn't normally do. The, the fact that you do some of the things you do with Tyson and some of the psychological reasons why life lessons and all these things, uh, fascinating, just absolutely fascinating. So, so talk to us about what it is that you do, especially with him, uh, why it's meaningful, why you do the manufactured adversity and just some of the benefits you've seen from it. 
Yeah. So the first, the first thing is once you put that stuff out there, all right, it's on the calendar. You're going to do this hard thing. We'll get into the different examples of that in a second, but once it's out there on the calendar, you have this crazy hard thing and you put it on a monthly basis, this fucking, this, this, this lights a fire under your ass. This makes you get up early in the morning and keeps you a little nervous, a little on edge, a good way of pushing you and pressing you knowing that that, that guillotine is, is, is coming down soon and you better stay focused and stay sharp. So it keeps you disciplined. It keeps you energetic. It keeps you, I say, bring the fucking fire every second of every second. It helps you do that all day because you know, this thing is coming up. And you also know, once you do that, there's going to be another one coming up and that's going to keep going on and on. So it keeps you sharp, keeps you focused and disciplined. And the reason for it is I said, we, we manufacture adversities because I'm going to, I'm going to buy them tons of shit. We have all, they have a whole room, literally an entire room full of Legos. There's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pieces of Legos in that room. And hundreds, probably thousands of actually things put together. I'm going to give them all kinds of shit, but I'm also going to teach them at the same time how to work, how to, how to, manu- like I said, manufacture diversity. So they're not getting, losing out on that, those skills, those life skills that as, as a tough childhood gives you, because if, if you've seen most successful people that you see always talk about their shitty childhoods and they, because they use that. So if you take that away from a kid and just give them the silver spoon, they're probably going to be this fucked up entitled adult. So it's manufactured diversity and it, it goes on so many different levels on a small level than on those monthly challenge levels. But for instance, but when I lived in New York, I was working out here in California, doing some masterminds stuff, coaching, doing some coaching programs. I would cut him out of school sometimes for a week. He would come with me and we travel here. And I would tell him, listen, when we travel, you could bring as much stuff as you want, as much as you want, but you're carrying all your own luggage. So you can bring as many toys as you want. You're going to carry it all. When we get to the, get there, we get to the hotel. We're going to go to the grocery store. We're going to get our, obviously our, our healthy food or whatever, but you're going to get, you can get as much food as you want, but you're going to be, we're going to walk to the grocery store from the hotel. We're going to get our stuff and we're carrying all of our own stuff back. Like these were always like just parts of the game. It made it a challenge, made it a game. It's like, right. Everything's not going to be easy. You're not just getting off, off of school uh, just to come and hang out. We're going to, we're going to put in some work and we're going to have a shitload of fun and connect and bond at the same time. So it's to show that because that's really what my childhood was like. I wouldn't go to the grocery store. I, my mother didn't have a car. She didn't get her driver's license until she was like 50, I think. We'd rock to the grocery store. I'm three years old, literally helping her carry groceries back miles from the store whenever we'd go grocery shopping. And I believe that's that like toughened me up. It gave me endurance and discipline and, and not being entitled. And so I'm trying to pass down the things that I learned. So it's manufacturing that type of stuff. It's even now in the house. like. We, we, of course, they have regular basic chores that kids should have, but the stuff that's above and beyond the normal chores, like I haven't done, and 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 he'll get paid for it. So he's learning, learns how to earn. I haven't done my own laundry, probably Tyson since he's five or six has been doing my laundry for me. Literally, he does the laundry, folds it, knows exactly where everything goes, puts it away. Two two times a week, it gets done. I haven't touched it. I haven't touched the laundry. He gets paid for that. So additional stuff above and beyond, like, like the normal kids' chores, like doing addition stuff, like my own personal stuff that's saving me time. It's me working on delegation. It's him learning about delegation, him learning about earning money, working hard. And listen, he doesn't want to do my laundry that week. You don't have to do it. You just won't get paid. That's fine. You're going to learn about working hard. The harder you work, the more you're going to earn and the harder you can play it. And you can go buy more Legos of this stuff. All my supplements, like every day, I, I, I take a lot of different vitamins, vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin E, whatever, calcium, a ton of different, just daily vitamins. And every day, so I take them three different times a day. That means I'm undoing like 12 different bottles, taking the pill out, doing it, putting it back in. I thought about it. And now for at least two, three years now, he takes them all out and separate. He knows which ones I take in the morning, which ones I take in the middle of the day and night. He separates them into these three different containers that are set for the whole week for all three. They're all piled in there. All I have to do now, it used to take me 10 minutes, is just dump it out and I'm good. He does that with my pre-workouts, my post-workouts, my protein shakes. He does all that and he gets paid for it all. He's learning how to earn money, how to, he's, it's a lot of attention to detail because it's like, all right, vitamin C, I take in the morning and at night, but not in the middle. Vitamin E, like each one is specific. He's got to pay attention to the details about what goes where. And I always tell him, I'm like, you don't, you probably, don't even, you probably don't even look at that stuff. You fuck with me. So no wonder I'm always awake at nighttime. You probably put my pre-workout at nighttime and you put my post-workout in the morning. That's why I'm all fucked up. But it, it's just a joke. But he, he, it's, a, it's teaching him attention to detail, discipline, learning, and 
working, how to, that you have to earn the money you're going to get. I'm not just going to give you an allowance. You're going to work for it. You're going to earn it. Things that are actually helping me. Now that's helping me save time. So I could actually go work and provide for the family better and, and have more time for the shit that I need to do. It's like a win-win. There's just such, so many layers of, of how that helps the family and our relationship and, and everything. And there's several things like that that he'll do throughout the week that he gets paid for in addition to his normal, just kid chores that should be done because the kids shouldn't get done paid or an allowance for cleaning their room or for helping to set up for dinner or clean the dishes or something like that. To me, that's like just normal stuff they should be doing and they do that automatically, but the above and beyond stuff that saves me time. Oh yeah. You'll get, you'll get paid for it and, and I'll pay him pretty good. I like that man. And, and he's 10, right? Yes. That's awesome. So he's learning these lessons really early. Oh yeah. 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 And he hears it's, it's crazy. I remember when I first started opening, started personal training, open my gym, my goal was to make $60,000 a year. To me, that was like a million bucks at the time. Like I'm going to be so rich. I'll be set for life. He hears now someone making a hundred thousand dollars a year. He's like, Oh, that's it. Like they must be struggling. Like he already thinks and knows like what earning is and different amounts of money and different investments and uh, profits. And would, would you rather make a million dollars a year with 20% profits or make $600,000 a year with 80% profits? He's like, well, of course that, who cares if you're making them like, like teaching that kind of stuff and earning the, the value of a dollar and the value of his time. And it's yeah, def definitely some deep lessons that I wish someone taught me at that age. It's interesting that you're, you're having these conversations with him. I've been talking to my two older ones about that a lot lately because they're very curious. I mean, we, we have very open discussions around money we've had for years. Uh, one of the requirements of the boys is they have to save their money, you know, save a percentage of their money. It actually goes into what we call a custodial account where they're, they, they're actually investing right now, which is great. But we sat down and especially my oldest, the one that you met, he's like, dad, like, I really want to, I really want to make more money. I was like, well, I was like, if you want to make more money, I was like, you've got a couple of different choices here. Number one, you can go to work for somebody, right? Or you can learn a skill that's valuable to somebody else and be paid for that. And I was like, in, in, in my experience, if you learn the skills that are valuable to other people, uh, chances are you could probably make more, you will make more money and uh, you'll probably be the master of a little bit more of your time. And he's like, well, what does that really mean? I was like, well, when you think about making money, what do you think about it? He's like, well, my friend Connor works at Popeye's. I was like, okay, well, how much does Connor make? He was like, oh, it makes $11 an hour. I was like, okay, it makes $11 an hour. 30% of that's going to taxes right away. So call it eight. And then we just count how, how, how long is this shift? So he's like, well, right now he's working a ton. He's trying to save for college and a car and all this stuff. I was like, okay, well, great. I was like, if he's doing that, uh, seven hour shifts, that basically comes out to be about 57 bucks per day. This is what it is per week. You know, he's giving up all these hours per week. I was like, listen, I was like, if you want to go to work, you know, and learn something, I was like, I actually need some help with video editing and uploading. I was like, so, and here's what I would pay you. You know, I'd pay you 25 bucks an hour to do that for me. Mm -hmm. And in order for you to do that though, you need to prove to me that you're going to do this and take it seriously. And I said, in order to do that, I need you to go online. I need you to Google it. I need you to learn how to do these things. And once you've learned it, then let's go ahead and implement. But what I did was, is I broke down. I was like, listen, you're going to be making $25 an hour or, yeah, or for instance, I would say $25 per project that we do. Once you get really good with video editing, you might be able to crank one of these out in 30 minutes. I was like, if you're doing two of these an hour for me, you just made 50 bucks an hour. I was like, think about, you know, your, your buddy Connor has to work the entire day. Mm -hmm. to make the same that you would make. And then, and then we crunched and he's like, Oh my God. And then we crunched it. I was like, and per month, if you pick up other clients, like besides me, right, we get the word out that this is the work you do. And here's some of the great things you do. Other people might hire you. Then you can go to this and let's just put it hour for hour. Your buddy's working 22 hours a week. You're working 22 hours a week. Here's what he's making. Here's what you're making. And he was like, it was a couple thousand dollars. And he was just like, Oh my God, that's crazy. Right. So it was, it was such a cool lesson. I love these, you know, these financial discussions with kids. You see their eyes open up. Um, I yeah, want that's to kind of shit they're not going to teach them in school either. That's kind of shit they should be teaching, but they, they won't teach them that in school. My God, dude, don't even get me started. Right. I think yeah. both you and I don't even get us started. Cause it's just like, ah, oh, it's just yeah, yeah. Thing we're teaching. Right. Um, I want, I want you to talk more about some of these really fascinating 24 hour challenges that you do as a family. Yeah, sure. So 
it really all started with a, a couple of guys from the project were putting together this event to drive from from Chino Hills, which is here in California, down to San Diego. It's about 131 miles. They're going to ride their bikes down there. And they set a date. It was about three months down, out because they wanted to train for it and get the right types of bikes and gear and all this other stuff and get trained for it. And they asked if I wanted in. I'm like, yeah, I, I want in. Me, me and Tyson will do it. They're like, you sure? You want to ask him first? I'm like, no, I'll just, I'll, I, he'll be in. We're in. Like, are you sure about that? Like, this is a, a hard thing. Like, people train for years to be able to ride 100 miles. Like, athletes. I'm like, well, he'll be fine. So I told, told Tyson, hey, you want to ride with me our bikes down to San Diego? He's like, yeah, but he knew it would be on a weekend. He thought it was coming up that weekend and he was ready to do it. It was literally three days later, he was ready to do it, go jump on our bikes. And we have no fancy bikes. We have our Walmart specials that the only the only training we did for this was we took our, our Remington gun oil and sprayed it on the chains of our bikes to make sure it was nice and lubed up. That's the only maintenance we did in our bikes, literally, and just rode down there. Uh, we, we went a slower pace than, than everyone else. We left at like 2.30 in the morning. It took us almost 15 hours to do it, but we did it. And when we finished, some guys were like, their legs were done. They were shot. And, and they had the bikes that do, those bikes, I don't know if you've ever seen them, those street bikes, those fucking things are like cheating. They do like 75% of the work for you. Like we'll be, me and Tyson will be riding sometimes on a trail and there'll be some big fat dude come flying. They're yelling on your left, on your left, nonstop. They're yelling us on your left. Meaning they're going to pass us because we're just riding regular bikes working and their bike is just cruising and doing all the work for them. And those things weigh like two pounds. So we finished and a lot of the guys were, were like beat and saying they're going to, it's going to take them a week to recover. And we sat, we went home and we talked about, we were like, it wasn't that fucking hard. Like we do what we did. We went on a bike ride. That's all we did. How hard it is to ride a bike. And we were in the gym the next day. It, it, it was, I forget the holiday it was next day. It was off school on Monday. We were in the gym the next day, working out, doing legs and everything. We were totally fine. And we sat there then that night and we said, all right, this was supposed to be hard. We need more of a challenge. We made a list of a bunch of different things that we wanted to challenges, personal family challenge. We wanted to do And me and, and Tyson and, and my daughter, we call her Midge. We made a whole list of, of things we wanted to do within the next couple of years, some ideas. And they came up with some crazy shit. They wanted to bench press a whale. They want to punch a shark, uh, wrestle a bear. So I'm like, all right, whatever. We got to figure out how to do this shit. So our, our first one ended up being 24 hours of pushups. Yeah. So we started off simple while well, I figured out how the fuck we're going to wrestle a bear for our next challenges. So we started off simple 24 hours of pushups. So literally for, for 24 hours, we did pushups and real pushups, like our style pushups where our chest is touching the floor. Our arms are locking out. Our feet are touching no, no bullshit internet pushups. And we stayed up the entire night, 24 hours. And you do, you do a set, you take a couple seconds off. We had a timer going off every minute in the house. So we knew on the minute to try and keep a pace going to it. And we did that. We did several thousands of them in, in the 24 hours at the end. Like that was almost a year ago. And I still have some elbow fucking strain from that, but that's the whole point of it. That's like to remember like the work you did, the things you accomplished, it's fucking worth it. We've done 24 hours uh, a bench press a whale. So I had to figure out how to do, all right, how are we going to bench press a whale? So we looked up and my, I think my daughter came up with that one, bench press a whale. I'm like, I don't know what the fuck that means, but all right, we're going to figure it out. So we looked up, how much does a whale weigh? We figured a, a blue whale was 350,000 pounds. All right, so I said, all right, we're going to do weightlifting for 24 hours as a family. And we're going to log every set we do and accumulated our weight. We're going to get more than 350,000 pounds. And so we did that. And, and I think I did it. I did the whale by myself. And then Tyson did like, I think he did 120 something thousand pounds. He, he lifted in 24 hours. So literally if you did say a hundred pounds for 10 reps, that's a thousand pounds. So you just put that on and you just keep tracking that and, and adding it up the whole day and making it a game. But this is also then 24 hours of staying together, of challenging, of after 10 hours and your body's beaten down and you want to just go to sleep and stop being there, helping each other, connecting, like the things that we talk about, the deep conversations. Then in the middle of the night, when you're really starting to get delusional, start you start having all these different thoughts. Like I had a notepad next to me. I'm putting down new business ideas that we're going to start. There's these different online courses we're going to do. Like every challenge, I end up starting a new fucking business somehow because I'm thinking it sparks like this. It takes you to a different level, that different level of like consciousness where you kind of come out, out of yourself. Then we did also a 24-hour bike ride. After that that bike ride we did to San Diego, it only took us like 15 hours. So we did 24 hours of, of biking where we just bike. Of course, you're not nonstop biking. It's we stop, we eat, we, and then we jump back on, see how many miles we can get 
in 24 hours. We did a 24 hour hike that we did. That was fucking brutal. Actually, the hike that that you came for the Squire program, we just did that loop with all those hills nonstop for 24 hours. We had a, a bunch of uh, people come to that. And most of these we do for a fundraiser where we put a charity up there, we get donations and, and we go and do it and we get people to join us or have other people run similar event on different parts of the country. And it all goes towards fundraisers, usually either something to do with kids, something to do with the military or something to do with animals. That's the three things that we wanted to, to do fundraisers for. And after a certain amount of, of challenges, the last one we did just last month during their Christmas break, they fucking convinced me that after we do a certain amount of challenges, they got to do this one challenge and it was 24 hours of video games. So we sat there and we tallied up our kills of how many kills we can get in 24 hours in all these games. And I don't remember the number. It was like 60,000 or something like that kills that we did uh, in 24 hours. So we literally played games as a family, 24 hours. But again, it's, it's just, it's the challenge is one thing, accomplishing it, bettering yourself, whatever you want to call it. But it's not about the challenge. The challenge itself is the easy part. It's the build up to the challenge, the knowing that it's there, it's always hanging over your head. And it's the, the connecting and the bonding that you're doing during the challenge. The, in any goal, any goal, the, the fucking goal is never the goal. I call the goal the lowercase goal, G-O-L-E. The real goal, the uppercase goal, is the steps it took to get there. It's the process, the journey of getting to that goal. Once you hit it, it's like, You've already done all the, you've already got all the experience, all the lessons, all the stories in leading up to that goal. So uh, the next ones we have, we're going to do a 24 hour boot camp class. We're going to do a 24 hour boxing class and the wrestle of bear I came up with, we're going to do it not for a few months. This is down later in the year is 24 hours of jujitsu where we're just going to get a jujitsu gym to sponsor it, get some sponsors, turn to a fundraiser and do jujitsu for 24 hours. So those are some of the upcoming challenges we have to do. And just knowing me just saying this now, gets me a little fucking nervous. Like, fuck, that is going to suck. Like, but it keeps you sharp. It makes when my alarm goes off at, at 4.15 or 4.30, whatever time it is for that day, I'm out of bed. I'm hot. Like I got some, I got some shit to get ready for. Like I know that that's hanging over my head at all times. Like it will keep you freaking sharp and it bleeds over into other areas of life. It makes us not miss workouts. It makes us train hard. It makes you work hard. It makes you stay focused and stay sharp and eat right and eat healthy and stay connected as a, as a family. Like, it's much more than just the, the outcome of the challenge. That's like the, the, that's just the byproduct is the, the goal is just the byproduct. I love this, man. Um, I never thought about doing challenges quite like this until I spent some time with you at the Squire program. Uh, we, we are actually though, me and my 14 year old, you haven't met him, but he and I are in the midst right now of doing a big challenge. Uh, he and I are training for a bodybuilding show. And that's going to be a, on April 30th. And that the reason, awesome. yeah, man, the reason I wanted to share this with you though, is because it's exactly that. So, um, my 14 year old, his birthday is always on January. It's his birthday is on January 1st. We've had this tradition in our family forever that we all get together as a family. We play games that night. We hang out that night, the big apple drops. And then at 12 midnight, he blows out his candle for his next birthday. And this past week, year, we, we've done what we've, all, what we've always kind of done is we sit down as a family and like, hey, what, what's, what are some of the big things we want to do this year? In years past, you know, like uh, I've, I've climbed 14ers with my two older boys, things like that. So, you know, this year was this last year was the this year was the Squire program. That was one of them. But I sat down with my son, who's a pretty fit kid. And uh, he's like, I want to do a bodybuilding show. I, I used to do those back in the day. I haven't done one for years. And he's like, I want to do a bodybuilding show. And I'm like, wow, really? And I was like, I don't know if they have one for a 14 year old. We looked it up. Sure enough, there's one just three hours from here in April 30th. It's like, there, there's actually one. He's like, cool. I want you to do it with me. And I was like, let's do that. And here's, here's what I can tell you that's right along with what you just said. Of course, me being very competitive, I wanted to go there and I want to do well. Right. But that's 10% of it. Mm -hmm. That's, that's one thing that keeps me sharp, right? Keep, keeps us in the gym. But for us, man, it's exactly what you just said. I get to spend five, six hours, seven hours a, a week in the gym with him. We get to lift really heavy shit together. We're spotting each other. We're pushing each other. We're sweating. We're going through pain with each other. We're watching our diet together. It's all these conversations that we're having on the way to the gym, on the way home. It's during the gym. I'll purposely 
push myself to absolute and complete failure so that kid can can pull that weight off of me when I'm bench pressing. And I do the same with him. And it just sends these amazing messages and connections like, hey, son, I got you. Hey, mm-hmm. son, you got me. Like, I need your help too, right? But the 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 journey and the connections by going through something difficult, training for something that makes you feel uncomfortable is unbelievable. And I, I was telling my son this just, just the other day is that what we learned at Squire, which I know came from John Eldridge, which is uh, every man needs a battle to fight and adventure to be had and a beauty to rescue. Mm-hmm. And th- signing up for that thing, man, I have been so razor focused. You know, the alarm goes off, I'm gone, man. The, we don't skip a day. Like mm-hmm. sometimes we, we train, we train, we go over, you know, we, we go over and above, above and beyond. And it's that, that battle, it's that focus. It's that, man, we're sharing, we're, we're kind of bleeding and sweating together for the same purpose, but it's these amazing experiences along the way. So I, I love the fact that you do this, man, on a monthly basis with your kids, man. Yeah, it's, it's freaking awesome. And yeah. we look forward to it. And then each time when we're done, we're like, all right, next one, we gotta, we gotta come up with something harder. We gotta make it even harder. So it's yeah. even, even worse and more challenging and just keep pushing the, pushing the pace and pushing each other, pressuring each other. It's freaking awesome. That's awesome what you're doing. I love that what you're doing. That's a, that's a huge thing there too. Like just so many factors of that then going on stage in front of other people like that alone is the scary part to a lot of people. So that, that's, that's fucking awesome. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. I, I know we're winding down to, to the top of the hour, but I want to ask you one more question about, um, now I know the answer to this, uh, and, but I'm sure the guys are like, what does this guy's wife have to say about all this? I already know the answer, but I would love for you to share um, the relationship you have with her, what she says about all this. Yeah, she's a, she's a freak just like us. She's, she, we, she, we call, she goes by the Russian. And the funny thing is, she's not even from fucking Russia. So that's the funniest part of it. But she goes by, the, she's, she's down with everything. She, the whole entire family does it. She does all these challenges with us. My daughter does them. But they, they're, they're in for it all the time. She just had a surgery now, so she's missing the next challenge that we're doing. But she is all in for it. And I think that's a huge part of it, too. It makes, it's a, a connection for us as an entire family. Of course, me and my son of, like we said, breaking the cycle, being that positive male role model to create those future leaders. But just as a connection with the entire family, with my wife, with my daughter, it's it's all pieces of the puzzle. And yeah, that's a huge part of it is as you're, if, if, if she wasn't on board with it or even this or in all personal development, like even when I started meditating, I first started meditating five, six years ago. I thought it was nuts. I never was into meditation, but I got her into it because I was thinking I, I can't really start leveling up. And if you start leveling up, you start doing these hard things and you're not having the people around you also doing that pretty soon. She'll be still be speaking Russian and I'll be speaking Chinese or something. Now you're speaking different languages. You need to take that person along for the ride with you, whatever it takes in some capacity so that you're loving up together, growing together, going through these experiences together. And I'll tell you what, it's all about creating those experiences. This is the shit that you're talking about, that bodybuilding thing. Your son's going to remember that 10, 20, 30 years from now. He'll remember the conversations you had. He'll remember what you ate for breakfast that day, the clothes, the color of the shorts you were wearing. Like creating experiences like that as a family, especially with your son, but just as your family with your 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 wife is what it's all about. Shit that they're going to remember, shit that's going to be impacted on. And if you're not creating experiences like that on a regular basis, then what's the fucking point? Like try to even think about how you could do that on a daily basis. It's hard to do to create those type of massive experience on a daily basis, but there is something you could do. Like if you live like that every day, all right, I'm going to make today where 30 years from now, my son's going to remember this fucking day. What can I do to make that happen? Like that's the way to, to live and just get after it and make shit happen. Yeah, I love that, dude. Uh, man, thank you so much for coming on. I want to make sure that the men can find everything that you're doing because I know there's a variety of different things, uh, different resources you have out there. So what is the best way for our guys to connect with you? This would probably be on Instagram. It's just steve.eckert1, the number one. That's probably the best way because I, that I talk about all the different programs. They're all some sorts of forms of coaching. I do just one-on-one personal discipline and personal development coaching for men in their mind, their body, their business, but then also the project, which is the group stuff. Then I also do a leadership and team development training, which is around the country, training companies and their teams. So the project is a men's personal development program held here in California for just men in person, four day event. Private coaching is done for anyone all around the world online. And then there's the LTD where 
myself and my Navy SEAL partner, Ray Care, we actually travel the country and go to teams. But I talk about all those and there's information and resources for all those. Probably the, the hub would be on Instagram, which is, is steve.eckert1, the number one. Well, not to worry, gentlemen, we're going to have um, everything to con- to get in contact with Steve on on the actual show notes uh, landing page, which is uh, the dot com forward slash 360. And yes, uh, we had Ray on last week. You guys heard from uh, Ray Cash Care. Uh, obviously, Steve and, um, and Ray work together. Uh, this was amazing, man. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, just a couple of highlights, right? Uh, number one, Make sure you guys go check out that book because I am too. Psycho uh, cyber cybergenics is that right? Cybernetics. Cybernetics. Psycho cybernetics. Uh, also, outwitting the devil. Own your mind was another one. Also, we talked about uh, how we can overcome the story that we're living within. Right, the story that we're telling ourselves. Are you are you a decision maker? Are you a pattern breaker? Or are you just somebody who's a victim of your own story? I loved hearing that. And then. Man, these these uh these challenges, especially as a family, that's amazing, man. And you're right. And I can tell you firsthand, doing the Squire program, doing things I've done in the past, and now training for this show, it's the journey, man. It's the growth. It's the connections. It's the cool things you get to to do along the way. But thank you so much for coming on, man. Yeah, it was freaking awesome. If you need anything, anytime, twenty four hours a day, you're one of us. You're you're on our our team. So if you ever need anything, let me know. I'm there to help. Appreciate you, man. Gentlemen, go out, live legendary. Take care.